Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of New Books Network. This is Morteza Hajizadeh, your host from Critical Theory Channel. Today, I'm honored to be speaking to Keith Tribe uh, about a wonderful book he published with Oxford University Press. The book is called Constructing Economic Science, the Invention of a Discipline, 1850 to 1950. Uh, Dr. Keith Tribe is a senior research fellow in the history at the University of Tartu, and uh, he'll be introducing himself to us. He'll tell us a little bit about himself and how he came uh, to write this book. Keith, welcome to New Books Network. Uh, hello. Thanks for inviting me to uh, do this presentation. Uh, yes. Can you tell us a little about yourself, please? Yeah. Um, well, say I'm a, uh, I'm a well, I'm past retirement age, obviously, but I'm a, currently a research professor in history at Tartu in Estonia. And next year, uh, from January, I'm joining a five-year uh, European Research Council uh, project on 18th century Swedish history. So that's a long way from uh, where um, where this book is. But it relates to the fact that my general interest is really and always has been ever since I've been a postgraduate uh, in uh, the history of European political economy economics, uh, early modern, so basically 17th century onwards. And uh, this book itself uh, uh, originated from a part of that interest in the 1980s uh, when I was member of a, a project, uh, uh, the first real uh, international project on the development of economics, uh, uh, which was a, a, a European, North American and Japanese project, basically, um, which looked at initially was 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 meant to look at the when the first chairs of economics, when the first major posts of economics were founded. And the general idea in the early 80s, when this was proposed by some Italians, uh, was that uh, the economics, it, as we know it today as a university discipline, in a sense diffused from centres, so particularly from Britain uh, initially. And, but also the Italians had an interest because they claimed uh, uh, that the first chair in the 1760s, where well, the Swedes could claim one in the 1730s, the Germans could claim one in the 1720s, you know, depending on how you define the subject. But what, so, so the project was then taken up and, and organized through King's College Cambridge, uh, mainly by uh, my late colleague, uh, Istvan Hont, uh, who uh, had basically organized a, a series of workshops and networks. And the important point that arose uh, as we worked on this was that, uh, in fact, there was no diffusion process as such. This idea of a sequence arising from, you know, a center and then diffusing outwards. Uh, this, what, what we noticed was that in terms of what we regarded as modern economics, were the sorts of economics we know from the 20th century. Um, that actually, this all happened in a rush together across the world in the late uh, in the late uh, 19th century. Um, and we had no real explanation for this, um, but but we this is this is what the various things, the various publications, all the all the national groups published uh, collections of essays on on what they'd found. But I, I took up this issue for I, I was mainly work, I had been working in the nineteen in nineteen eighties on Germany and published a book in nineteen eighty eight on eighteenth century Germany, um, but and then I switched my attention to Britain uh, and what had happened in Britain, um, and so it's been a long long time in gestation actually since the nineteen nineties. A lot of the basic spade work that's in this book now. Uh, dates back to work I did in the 1990s. Um, but what, uh, what, what I, uh, as I worked on this, what I realized was the, the, the answer to the problem of why it was uh, economics that we know today became so suddenly, effectively, a universal kind of knowledge. 
uh, was because of the development in the United States of what we now know as the modern university. That is a university aimed at mass education uh, with faculties and departments with specialization. The best short description of this is actually at the beginning of Max Weber's uh, Sciences of Vacation, which was published in 1917. Where he, it's, a, it's a lecture he gave in 1917, a public lecture, where he describes uh, the modern university as a sort of capitalist enterprise based on division of labor and specialization. And this is also related to the kind of critique of the business university that Veblen uh, developed, Torstein Veblen developed in the States around about the same time. But it was this German, this American university based on a, a misunderstanding really of the older German university tradition. Um, and it's important that as well, basically a lot of Americans went to Germany to study at graduate level uh, in the later 19th century, because I mean, across all sorts of disciplines, because there were no sort of graduate institutions really in the United States. Johns Hopkins was initially, but generally speaking, if you wanted to get any further than a general undergraduate degree, um, you didn't have a chance to do that in the United States in the late 19th century. And so people, after the, the unification of Germany and after the American Civil War, uh, went to Germany, audited lectures, did postgraduate degrees and all sorts of stuff. And the German university at that time uh, was organized around a professor who was a sort of universal person who embodied the knowledge of his field. Um, and so what the Americans did effectively by, by a number of, of, of ways it worked was to uh, take this role of, of the professor and make that professor a department and and split the knowledge, all the different developing areas of knowledge into different specialized fields, which individuals would then develop their careers through. But the second point also, which is very important in this German model, was that and a common under, misunderstanding of, un, of the older university system was it somehow was you know, kind of elite knowledge or whatever. Basically, the old traditional university back to medieval times was a vocational institution. The German universities were run by the individual, individual states. They were public institutions um, and they were split into four faculties. They were there for to the theology faculty trained clerics, the law faculty trained lawyers, uh, the medical faculty trained uh, physicians and the uh, philosophy faculty mainly was there to train teachers. And so it was it was most of the students going through this system were, in fact, um, as it were, training, doing a vocational type of, 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 of degree. They were actually looking to gain some kind of qualification, which would allow them to build a career. But the Americans didn't see this because they were doing graduate work and they they sort of invented this idea of the specialized university, um, not uh, passing on established knowledge, but creating new knowledge and, and all that sort of thing, which is what graduates, what, what graduate level education is like. And so that's. That was really you know, a productive misunderstanding. And in the first substantive chapter in my book, I describe how this all happens with the American system, the German system, the American system, and then how this gets adapted in the British system through the University of London uh, from, from the really from the mid-19th century. Um, and so the first thing to do is to kind of identify the institution which makes this makes possible developing economics as a discipline rather than as had existed since the early 17th century as sort of diffuse arguments and reasoning about trade and exchange and production and money and banking or whatever. Um, so this is what I call public knowledge um, that anyone can read, can join in the argument um, that people like Adam Smith um, in the 17, in 1770s and the late 18th century is writing for legislators and men of affairs, in quotes. Um, so they're, in a sense, giving counsel to people who have influence, businessmen, bankers, and this sort of thing. Um, and, 
And then there are other kinds of popular, it become, through the 19th century, that becomes more popular. Books themselves become cheaper, so it's easier for people to read about this thing because you get newspapers and journals and books. You get educational courses developed, adult educational courses developed. And then right at the end of the century, and, and this is the case in Britain, you get the the development, actually in 1903 in Cambridge, you get the creation of the first three-year dedicated undergraduate degree certifying you as a trained economist. And this is a certification process that's important. And just to carry on this thread to kind of sketch, sketch the story out, this, the book is mainly about Britain. It's called The Invention of, a, of a, it says, 1850 to 1950, and the, most of the material in it is British. But there is a lot of German and French material and American material in it as well as comparison. Um, but um, some people have said, oh, this is just about Britain. This isn't about a discipline, the new discipline in general. And I say, no, no, it's, it, it, the, the story has to be told about Britain because this is where the whole thing really got set up in the first place. And we can com make comparisons. So, for example, in the United States, <clears throat> for sure, um, the American Economic Association was founded in the 18, late 1880s. There were the Journal of Political Economy and the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which are leading economics journals still today. Uh, were founded in the uh, late 1880s, early 1890s. Um, but because of the generalized nature of American undergraduate education, four-year degree doing majors and this sort of thing, there was no real specialization within, within American departments until the 1930s when graduate education really started to take off in a big way. Um, so really the american process of consolidation dates more mainly from the from the 1930s similarly in germany um the americans have gone to germany to to understand their their to understand developed economics but um there was no undergraduate or equivalent degree all you could do in germany was a doctorate in economics you could had to do an advanced degree you could, you could become a professor of economics of one kind or another um of finance or whatever but um there wasn't really there wasn't an economics department you had they were basically in the faculty of philosophy mostly um and it was uh only in 1923 that a four-year diploma in economics got founded in Germany. And after that, was there were shed loads of people started studying that because actually this other story, commercial education, had developed in Germany very rapidly since 1898. In fact, by just before the First World War, the Germans had a completely worked out discipline of business economics, unlike anywhere else. Um, the, the Americans didn't have anything like that until the 1930s or 40s. Um, so they had journals, they had institutions, they had teachers, they had examinations and qualifications, had all that. But econ economists didn't have that. And only in 1923 was there a particular qualification, the diploma uh, developed. But of course, then what happened in Germany, a lot of these, these, these students were um, partly social democrats, uh, many of them were Jewish, um, and in the 1930s, of course, uh, those who were starting their careers lost the chance to vote their careers. They were just basically expelled. And so one of the other stories about this aspect of it is that Germans um, and Austrians emigrated partly to Britain, but mostly to the United States, had a massive impact on, on Amer the development of American economics uh, because they, for one thing, uh, their mathematical training was was probably better than the average American sort of uh, undergraduate student and so forth. So um, that's that's another reason. So another reason why the, there is this kind of delay uh, in 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 uh, in Germany. France is also a bit similar. It's even long takes even longer uh, for them to develop what we would today recognise as a kind of routine of teaching economics and that just to end up this final sort of the, the wrap up this this kind of overview the what i do in my book i focus on 
not on great ideas and great thinkers. I focus on the process of developing and training uh, economics or training, training students in economics. The great emphasis is on the teaching because if you don't have students, and this is very clear in the early days of economics, if you don't have students, you're not going to have a subject. You, you just need student numbers to teach, to raise finance, uh, and to develop discourse, develop discussion, to develop a department big enough for people to actually talk to each other and, and have some kind of uh, idea and develop their ideas. Um, so what I'm looking at is the university as a kind of machine for the development of a new kind of discourse, a new kind of specialized discourse with examinations, qualifications, um, societies, uh, uh, textbooks, uh, and of course, students who go through this. Because also the other thing is this kind of knowledge, which is embodied within this system, has to be what I call replica replicable. It has to be capable of replication. It has to be simplified enough in order for uh, it to be taught to students for them to absorb it and then them to go away and teach others later on in their life and develop their careers in it. And so far from the idea of a, a science, a economic science, and this will actually go, I mean, doesn't necessarily apply to the, the life sciences or engineering or whatever, but um, and natural sciences, but certainly for the humanities and social sciences, um, the idea that the the, the scientific state status of these is somehow in some kind of advancing knowledge, advancing the boundaries of knowledge, is I think a misconception. Um, that that the, the sort of the, the again, this is against the, the great thinkers and the, the brilliant ideas and this sort of things. Basically, um, certainly there are great great thinkers, if you like, and and great ideas, but the. My emphasis is on on the more mundane mass aspect of this. You know, how do you how do you make this kind of transmission mechanism of knowledge work for, you know, in a sense, the average student um, and uh, the, create the, the capacity for these average students to contribute to the building of a discipline through the creation of their careers. And obviously now we know like the whole thing of publishing stuff, becoming a specialist in, in this area, and the, the whole way in which the, the, the university system itself shifts uh, the attention away from teaching to research, the, the priority of research and where where uh, advancement of the individual rests entirely upon their their ability to raise funding, to do research, and to publish this research in recognised peer-reviewed journals, and and so on, and and so that's also what I'm really describing is how this system gets set up, whereby the economists or the or the, the academics themselves actually discount teaching. Nowadays, teaching is 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 left to junior staff, effectively, um, uh, discount teaching, uh, and see the development of research because their careers depend on this. Other, if they if they don't publish and they don't um, get prizes and all the rest of it, then they're not going to advance their careers. They're not going to have a job. Yeah, so they have to do that. <laughs> Yeah, yes, well, it's about yes. But so what I'm describing Im implicitly is how this this isn't an, a, some kind of error built into the system. This is how the system works. Um, that's that's the nature of the modern university. That's implicit in how it functions. So and, and I, I can talk. Uh, and well, shall I just carry on on that? Wait, day because... uh, wait. You're this. Well, I love listening to what you said, and I absolutely love how you kind of laid out how the university, the modern university started, and you also talked about the origin of universities, because I sometimes talk to some of my colleagues and they just make a comment that universities have failed in their missions to produce work-ready people. And I said, well, it's not really their only mission to produce work-ready people. And I love that idea yeah. that you mentioned about vocational uh, universities back in the Middle Ages. Um, I have a few questions here, so maybe we could talk about the, now that you've talked about the development of universities, about the transition of political economy 
uh, as a public knowledge to university as a discipline? What happened when this transition came about and how the nature of that political economy changed? Well, the, the way, because, as I say, the first certifi certi or certified economist comes out of Cambridge in 1905, effectively, uh, to, after the, in the, in the first, um, the first round of, um, uh, of, of final degrees for the, uh, for the, for the Cambridge, uh, uh, to Cambridge Tripos, they call it the Tripos for obscure reasons, but basically for the honours exam, honours, honours degree. Um, that story is very much tied up with the personality of Alfred Marshall, who um, became professor in Cambridge in 1885 and really transformed the way it worked. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that because we need to understand he, he, he in a sense, had a, a good idea. And, and the, 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 the latter story in my book um, is about how his ideas got undermined um and the, the london school of economics became in britain a, a bigger center but for the sorts of reasons which i talked about before um about the replication and stuff but alfred marshall the point about alfred marshall in cambridge um the only degree really um in, up until the the second the second third of the set well the, the after 1860s uh was the mathematical tripos mathematical degree um and um this became this this was became increasingly competitive uh it wasn't actually they weren't teaching mathematicians as such it was basically a, a training in logic and reasoning and argument and judgment and the way they did this um, what, what the colleges themselves, I mean, we must understand that I mean, Cambridge is still, and Oxford is still basically sets of colleges. They have faculties, but actually the teaching itself still goes on very much in colleges for the humanities and social sciences, obviously not for the natural sciences, but for the humanities and social sciences. Um, uh, so it's college based. Um, and um, the, um, Cambridge was so organized that it has a central in instance, the Senate, which could actually decide and set up new exams. Oxford doesn't have that in the same way. And so part of the argument of the book is to say, why did this happen in Cambridge and not in Oxford and whatever? So, but anyway, Cambridge has this central instance. Now the maths, maths tripos, the maths honours exam in, Cam in Cambridge became increasingly specialized. It, 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 they used to rank students. It, what you, you, the, those who got a first were ranked um, from one to whatever. The the top wrangler, they called them, was the top person. Uh, when Marshall uh, graduated in 1865, he was second. Uh, but the guy who came first um, eventually won a Nobel Prize in 1904 for his work on gases. I mean, so he was a, a exceptionally talented uh, physicist. Uh, but in these day, those days, so the physicists were trained by doing this tripos, and the, the other the other end of it, the bottom uh, first, would got this what they call the wooden spoon, um, the basic the person who came bottom of that ranked si system. That's where the idea of the wooden spoon comes from. Now, the colleges weren't very good at teaching, and so from the eighteen forties onwards, um, the someone who wanted to do, do well in the tripos to excel and do and 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 distinguish themselves had to um, get specialized private coaching or teaching which they called coaching people who had done well in the previous year's exams set up set themselves up as as tutors private tutors and recruited groups of young uh, students um, probably 12 or 15, who they trained in classes. And they, they, what they basically did, the training took the form of uh, teaching them in classes, in a competitive atmosphere of a class, to learn uh, various kinds of implements and instruments and formulae and all this sort of stuff. And that um, the examination which they would then be, uh, would, that would they would undergo, uh, challenge them to identify which of these instruments was relevant for which problem 
and to very quickly apply it and to use it. So it's a, it was a training in judgment. You had an array of, it, of instruments of analysis or whatever, and you had to work out for this problem, which of the things that you had been drilled in do, do you apply to it? Now, that, that's the sort of the idea, I think, that Marshall took into when he started teaching in, in the mid-1880s. He was teaching on a thing which by then was established called the Moral Sciences Tripos. But the Moral Sciences Tripos, which was involved with uh, philosophy and logic uh, and politics, as well as political economy, um, was basically a training in books. So you, 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 you actually... You, you did well in the exams for the moral sciences um, simply by reading books. It wasn't the same kind of thing. And what he wanted to do, I think, was he, he actually had this vision of economics as the future for people in, in politics and administration. Um, and he had a very strong social conscience. He was a, he was a sort of social liberal uh, in, the, in the British sense. Um, and uh, so he he had this idea he, he actually said in his inaugural address sending uh, young men because they were all young men at that time young men out into the world with uh, warm hearts and cool heads so the idea that they have a social conscience but they have an analytical approach to resolving the problems of the world and so this was the mission he saw for economics um and um so the, the, uh, the role of the, of the maths training he had had was to have this vision of economics as being a kind of array of instruments of, of, of means for analysis. And you, it's, uh, uh, he had this a metaphor for it as like a toolbox. And in order to solve the problem, you had to know which tool to take from the box and apply it properly and how to apply the tool as well. And so this was the kind of idea of the economics training that he saw. And he saw this was the minimum you needed for this was three years consistent training in economics um, to do this. And that's why he agitated for developing a, a separate economics degree. And he was eventually successful for various reasons, which I also outline. Um, but it also has to be said that what I do is um, I went on to look at, well, what happened to this economics tripos? I mean, so it's another aspect of the book. Uh, I built a database of about 400, uh, 4,500 students who had gone through the first 50 years of this tripos from 1905 to 1955 and looked at how they did, you know, the kind of rankings and, and de uh, qualification, how many thirds and whatever. And, and did people who studied, because in Cambridge, um, you have part one and part two of the uh, of the things. These days, part one is always a one year and then followed by a two year part two. Until the 1930s, it was the other way around. And so what you can show, uh, for example, is that in the early days, um, the people who actually did well in economics and, and, and actually the people we know about and heard about actually only studied economics for a year. Pigou himself, who was Marshall's successor in 1907, himself had only studied economics very, very briefly. And so there was a kind of paradox that the people who came out of Cambridge that we know about, I mean, John Maynard Keynes himself actually studied the maths tripos, and then he was coached in economics by Marshall for the civil service exam and went into the India office eventually, and then came back. So he, he, he never had a kind of a training in, in economics as such, though he, he could have done uh, at his age. Um, and so there's a paradox that Marshall had this vision of this systematic training in economics, which involved all kinds of analytical and applied material, statistics, mathematics, um, historical knowledge, geographical knowledge, all these kind of different things. Um, but actually, those people we know about um, had none of these things really, which is just a paradox. But importantly, um, I always um, see Marshall as he was rather slow in his writing as the, the man who knew too much, that he knew so much uh, about the world and, and the, the economies of the world and whatever. He, when he was much younger, he went on a, a two month, I think it was, tour of the United States looking at American factories. You know, he was interested in how factories worked and this sort of thing. And so, um, 
you know, he was he had this very hands on conception of the economy and how it worked. But of course, it's very diffuse and, and large. And he never really managed to pull this all together. He, in a sense, he knew too much. And his comeuppance, in a sense, so what happened was that in the, Lon- in, in, in the London School of Economics, which by the 1930s had been going since 1895, but mainly as a, 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 a commercial college, um, the pro- person who was professor of political economy then, um, from 1929, Lionel Robbins, um, uh, set about... Uh, converting what had been essentially a vocationally based uh, institution into a a science a science based um, organization. I mean, a science based discipline. And my my view is that Robbins. I mean, by in contrast to um, to Marshall, he's a man who didn't know very much. He knew no maths. He knew no statistics. He knew no history. Um, he didn't really know. Um, uh, very much in terms of economic theory. Um, he he claimed to know German, but I can demonstrate in the book that his knowledge of German was very patchy. Um, and um, so, uh, and I, these, but these aren't, my point about this is these aren't criticisms. I'm not trying to, uh, these aren't, denig- I'm not denigrating Robbins. What I'm saying is actually he succeeded in creating what then eventually became the textbook version of economics in Britain. And I show how the textbooks then developed in the, from the 1930s. He succeeded because he didn't know. I mean, you, if, if you don't know very much, it's quite easy to formalize it and make it technical. And so the difficulty comes in, in the technicality, not in the breadth of the stuff that you have to know. And so what he did, he converted economics from this kind of very baggy kind of thing where you had loads of different ideas you had to hold together and you had to have lots of judgment in order to work out what to do into this rather um, uh, systematic and um, easily assimilable uh, form of knowledge, but which appeared to be science. I mean, his so um, whereas uh, um, Marshall's inaugural uh, address as professor was all about, in a sense, the social function of economics. And also, of course, this is also the case of Robin's predecessor, an American, Alan Young, in uh, LSE. When in, I think, 1930, Robbins gave his inaugural lecture. Uh, it was all about how economics was a science. It was basically uh, not, you know, it was science which the, the normal people couldn't understand. You wouldn't understand any of it if you didn't have a training in it. And he, and he, and so the the last chapter of the book is called about scientization, and it's the way in which you transfer, you transform this discipline into an esoteric science which you can only understand if you've been trained for several years in it, which is a kind of version of what Marshall had been going on about, but actually in a different mode within the kind of institute, this kind of uh, this new kind of knowledge. And so, you know, and again, it's not criticism as such. I mean, so I'm just trying to describe this is what happened. And also I should emphasize that part of the problem with the book is that it's, it's very descriptive because I don't believe in, in defining things. And one of the recent review has said, I don't define what I mean by scientization. Uh, in, in, actually, which is a, tra- a straight translation of a German term, the Wissenschaftlichung, which I've known from the 1980s. It was a kind of thing. Uh, um, and they say, I don't define it, but, but uh, there's a whole chapter on it. And basically, I show how it works. And so my idea in the book as a whole is the detail is an attempt to show how what I've been just been talking about works in practice. I don't believe in uh, the kind of text which talks in generalities or in comparisons where you have, you know, you 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 filter out all sorts of things in order to make things compar- comparable. Well, I'm talking about Britain, knowing what is going on in the United States, knowing what's going on in France, knowing what's going on in Germany, uh, which are the major reference points uh, at this point. Um, and so the, 
it's it's just a very dense book and i've got a little note at the front which says to readers you know you will find this very hard going at times you know read through it skip over it who knows what device you're listening if you read it on oxford scholar you read it in chapter chunks you don't you don't you lose the flow of the book completely so you know who knows how people read this but but the point is it doesn't it has a logic under underlying it which i say the sorts of things i've been talking about but um, it's very, it, it actually documents in great detail as it goes through. So one of my other reviewers, uh, Emily Erickson, uh, uh, recently has uh, said that uh, she felt as though she was sitting in a faculty meeting in a sense of talking about sort of I and all these sorts of things, you know, and, you know, all the kinds of, but the, but my point is that this is this is the important stuff. This is how this is how it all functions. This is you know what is actually banal in the world is what is really important because this is the everyday functioning of whatever system we're in, uh, and and that you know that's what I'm trying to to document how this all works, who does what, why they do this, what mistakes they make, and all this sort of thing. You need all this to understand why the system turns out. There's no there's no kind of logic, necessary logic in the system, apart from, you know, the idea of a modern university and the kind of logic of its unfolding. It, 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 could, it, it could have taken different paths, but, but it didn't. It took this mm. path. And to understand this path, we need to understand exactly why and, and under what forces it, it followed through this i mean for just and just to finish that off just in terms of paths i mean on the american example i mean one of the reasons one of the major reasons of um why the american universities say in the last part of the of the of the 20th century became so powerful was actually veterans programs because the point is that the veterans of the first, second world war veterans of the korean war veterans of the vietnam war all had free access to to university education mm -hmm. and it produced this enormous expansion mainly in male but obviously by the time of vietnam also female um, stu student numbers i mean that, that actually that so so simply the the ability of students to go and study at, uh, at hi in higher education um, was actually in the United States the result simply of a program of, which was related to the fact that you have all these people who have been in, in the armed forces during uh, three major wars. You know that, that that's a you know example of the sort of chance chance events which reinforce something which was already very strong in the United States the mm -hmm. basic uh, power of the American university. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, when I was going through the book, it's a dense book, but it's very accessible. And I'm just saying it for the sake of the listeners. It's yeah, 366 pages, and we're just scratching the surface. We're providing an overview, but there's a lot of useful information in the book. And it's sort of easy to go through. There are 12 or 13 chapters, if I'm not mistaken. And each chapter has uh, several subsectors, which makes it easy to to read and follow. So I do urge our listeners uh, to 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 go through the book. I'm sure uh, they'll be amazed by the wealth of knowledge that is there. And um, in the final chapter of the book, in the conclusion, you talk about the problem of skills and the demand for students apart, uh, outside uh, science, science, sciences. Can you talk about that uh, uh, part of the book, please? Oh yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking that. Yes, um, yeah. This is and this is something which relates really to to Britain and and part of the problem I laboured with in with this book is that uh, generally speaking, we we don't know very much about the history of education in Britain. Um, Amer I mean, um, the American literature, the German literature, the French literature on their education systems is far better than than on on Britain. And so a lot of the material that I had to pull together came from all kinds of sort of university history, individual university histories and all kinds of bits and pieces. Plus also the other problem we, that uh, I, I had uh, compared, I know, to the German system was that simply that after the Second World War, the, before the Second World War, you can use university publications for who's on the staff, how many students there are, who are the people who graduate, um, and this sort of thing. Uh, but outside Cambridge and London, 
um, uh, this this sort of level of material wasn't published anymore after the Second World War. And so actually it's even impossible now to, to generate a reliable account of who was actually teaching in what institution at what time. Uh, the institutions themselves don't seem to have records of that. The University of London itself, uh, certainly in the later 1990s, had no real reliable um, records of its own graduates. When I looked at the uh, archives, in, when I was in the university archives, uh, looking at the trying to patch together uh, uh, individual accounts of putting names to the the generalized data I had on graduation, the numbers graduating that year, um, all I all I had was the, the was bound up copies of the notices that had been posted um, and notifying students what what grade or degree or degree they'd gotten this sort of thing. There's just very little material collected, so there's a problem within that. But um, so the history of education itself is very poorly developed and a lot of misconceptions. And so one of the problems um, that dogged the development of any discipline outside the natural sciences, engineering, life sciences, uh, medicine in, in Britain uh, was the fact that employers weren't really interested in university graduates. Um, that is that um, in Britain until 1947, uh, school uh, school leavers had to could only well you could only leave school at the age of 15 it was only in 1972 I think it was that this was advanced to 16 um, most uh, in, by in the early 1960s uh, most people left school at 15 um, I mean by most I mean something like 80 85 percent and uh, I'd say a good 50 percent of the total school uh, of well more than 50 percent of, of the of those leaving were completely uncertified what happened uh in britain uh was that uh the uh employers say uh well it would be teaching nursing uh banking insurance or all kinds of uh uh, employment preferred recruiting people at the age of 15 and training them themselves rather than uh, having someone aged about 21 who had a university degree in something or other um, and so there was there was very little demand I mean and so in commercial education um, the, this was also the case commercial education was a success in Britain where it involved basically sort of uh, training for people who were already employed by railway companies or banks or whatever um, they would go for, for occasional courses for London School of Economics for example where London School of Economics had big classes in railway economics in, in the beginning of the 20th century for example um, but these were for people who worked in railway offices in, in the railway business um, and um, so there was a, a quite a good demand for commercial education uh, in respect of just occasional teaching, uh, adult education effectively, uh, but there wasn't a, a huge demand for people with a what was then called a Bachelor of Commerce. Um, and uh, in particular, um, say when the Faculty of Commerce was set up, the first Faculty of Commerce in Britain, nominally was uh, Birmingham in 1901, um, that uh, the, the, the mistake was made to see the, the students for this coming mainly from school at age 18. Well, there, weren't, there were hardly any students in school at age 18. And so you already had a very limited pool of, of students on which to draw. Um, and uh, so this problem persisted. Um, that actually of vocational training. So there wasn't a great demand um, for students uh, or economics. And so I interviewed several people in the 90s who had studied in Cambridge and who had um, gained, you know, well, good firsts in economics in Cambridge. And mostly those who actually got relevant jobs is because of the fact they, they knew John Maynard Keynes and who, who, who held a political economy club and he, he found jobs for them. Um, but, you know, on the, on the open market, um, the, uh, even a Cambridge first in economics w was, was not particularly valuable uh, in the, in the 1930s. Um, so, the, there's that problem. And so combined with that, 
even from the from the 1950s so the 1950s you could say well you know universities are elite institutions and that they only actually recruit they only have something like five percent of the 18 year old cohort entering them um and uh so they're very elitist uh, and what people overlook is the fact that in fact, most stu- most school students left school at 15 and only, say, about 15% of the cohort would carry on. Well, actually, less than that, actually, something like 10% of the cohort uh, uh, went on to the age of 18, studying to the age of 18. And then something like 80% of them went to university. And what they studied was the sciences. So you couldn't, what could you do with a history degree? What could you do with an English degree? apart from teach history or English in school. And schools weren't interested particularly in having um, people who had degrees in history or English necessarily. Um, uh, the, the expansion of the schooling system relied to a great extent on on teacher training colleges and this sort of thing, which was uh, so they were parallel institutions. Um, but um, so what what is overlooked is the fact that well into the 1960s when i look about uh, my old schools um sort of who's going to university this year stuff is is what strikes you is the overwhelming number of people going into the natural sciences um that ob- obviously for obvious reasons in order to go into natural sciences or engineering or medicine you need uh, a serious uh, mathematical and physics and chemi- chemi- chemical background, um, and you need systematic training in this. Um, so that is what people stayed on at school to get. If you were going to go into banking, for example, then you'd leave school at fifteen um, and go into and be be taken on by a bank, a form of apprenticeship. But the other side to this also, so so this this gradually changed but it's been muddied by the expansion in the uh, 1990s when in fact all um post-school educations became universities so the teacher training institutions became universities um, nursing training was rolled into universities um in 2000 and i think it's particularly easy to see in nursing um that in fact this is a terrible thing to have done because the focus of nursing training shift was was necessarily shifted by the dynamics of the university with all the publish or perish stuff that i talked about before and so the vocational uh, practical aspects of the discipline of, of the training were uh, subordinated increasingly by the teaching staff by to to the the demands of of of, of the kind of career based thing they had uh, they had to do um, and and my my uh, toward in the conclusion of the book, I allude to or I develop a sort of a, an argument that the, the English education or the British education, well, not yes, it is English because Scottish isn't quite the same. Uh, the English educational system is suffers from two kinds of over specialization that schooling is over specialized so these days you have to by the by the age of 14 you've got to decide whether you want to go into medicine because if you choose if you don't you have to choose the right subjects from that time on Uh, and then after 16 you're only going to be studying three subjects till you're 18. Um, so you've got a very a very over specialized uh, late school education um so that's one problem but also it means that the um the undergraduate degree uh is itself over specialized as well that it, it, it actually has too great an emphasis on specialized knowledge as opposed to generalized useful knowledge compared with for example the four-year american Uh, undergraduate degree where you will do all sorts of different things and you will major in a particular topic but when you major in economics in most american undergraduate degrees you won't end up doing as much economics as you will have done in three years in in britain and that's a good thing basically you need the breadth you need this kind of different sort of uh, different kinds of skills um and so the, the British, as, uh, ironically, also um, through uh, 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 another misunderstanding, a, a, a terrible policy and misunderstanding, um, in the uh, in about 10, 
10 or well, about 15 years ago, uh, a process began to develop within European universities uh, a, a three-year model for, uh, for undergraduate degrees based on the British model. They called it the Anglo-Saxon model, not knowing that there is no Anglo-Saxon model because it's American and British systems are quite different. Um, and so part of the story of my book is to... Um, in, in the sphere of economics is what I know about because nobody else seems to have done anything like this across other disciplines in the same sort of way. I'm talking about economics, but but I'm trying to draw a general, general conclusions about problems within um, uh, the educational system, which is a point I came uh, came in at saying we we know so little about the educational system people I, I, I went to school when I was five and I left. The it was unusual then, but I left um, the my full time education eventually when I was 25, 26. So that's 21, uh, 21 years of my life was basically in one way or another with interludes spent in schooling and education. And no one's interested in what happens in that time. That's an important, incredibly important period of formation of people's lives. And yet nobody, nobody seems to be interested in the social impact of that, apart from sort of criticisms or endless arguments about syllabus and all the rest of it. So, um, so part of the message in my book is to put so much emphasis on this idea of teaching because it is so important um, for, for shaping young people and what they what they do and the ideas they have is such an important formative period and we know so little about it basically um there's there obviously there's there are specialists in in all of this but it's not part of the public discourse the public discourse is dominated by everyone's an expert on the educational system because we've all been through it you know so my own experience counts as you know is is the basis of my critique or whatever, of my school, of my university, or whatever. But um, really, there's very little systematic understanding, public understanding, of the, some of the points I made about the development of what the university does or why, um, and why it is that the university tends, in, say, in economics, to, to turn out um, people who are not really that suited for the kind of jobs which they go into because there's no no link i mean at one point in my career i left university and i went to work in a in a uh, in a, a, a school uh, uh, i taught six uh, 17 to 18 year olds economics and business science and part of my interest was to find out what on earth they learned as economics and i was horrified to find what, the way that economics was taught uh, in in school it was two years of these young people's lives completely wasted really in the study in this subject as opposed to business studies which was very well organized actually um, but um, so people in universities teach teach people in front of them without knowing anything about where they've come from, what they what they know, what they what they're doing, uh, what their interests are, um, and that the schools in their turn educate people with virtually no idea what goes on in universities and how universities work, and so just just at this level to say that you know it, it's what what you can show is this element of dislocation and the the way that the schooling system is f fragmented with obviously fragmented in in necessarily in different kinds of ways but where people just don't talk to each other about what they do or how they do or, or they or they regard it as something which isn't worth talking about you know that actually it's so it's so routine their routine the, teaching and and everyday life in universities and schools is so routine that you don't you don't you know who would talk about it to non to other than their fellow teachers or or colleagues or whatever so that's another aspect of the, the, the of the of the book which uh, which comes clearer at the end but is only sketched out in 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 very general terms mm. uh, it's uh, it, it was i guess a couple of weeks ago i accidentally came across an article on eon magazine called economics is once again becoming a worldly science and i came across the name alfred marshall i would have i wouldn't have known who he was 
uh, if I haven't read the book <laughs> that you published. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned that uh, b- uh, before we started recording the interview, you said that the book has recently won a very prestigious award. Am I right? Yes. Well, uh, prestigious. It's, it's uh, the European Society for the History of Economic Thought, mm. um, ESHET, um, is basically has an annual conference um mm. and it's a it's a basically a pan-european uh mm. meeting and uh uh last year every year it awards a book prize a monograph mm. prize and last year i was awarded uh the the best monograph uh prize for this and um and the pri- the prize is that you have to go and give a lecture at the next one so <laughs> i i i just come back from belgium uh the meeting was in liege a couple of mm. weeks ago um and uh I gave a, a, a lecture on this, so yes, I I I, uh, I was very I was very flattered to 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 uh, to, to gain this prize because mm. I say it's um, it it is to to, to some extent cri- critical both of economics as a discipline, but also the way in which the history of economics has been written yeah. as basically yeah. an idea of ideas and theories and mm. the advance of science and so mm. forth. Great, uh, congratulations on that. And is there any uh, other projects you're currently working on? Any other monographs? Well, so it's, I've come to the end of a period to say I've been working on this book for well, actually, forty years, I suppose, <laughs> since the since the late nineteen eighties, um, in one way or another. But I, I dropped it because I got so disheartened at times. But also parallel to this, I I had I had been work, doing a lot of work on the 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 on Max Weber. Uh, and um, parallel to this, in 2019, I published a uh, a new translation of the first part of his great work, Economy and Society, and that was that was a result of a, a lo- also a long period of work. It's basically work that I started in the early 1980s or in interest, because I also worked as a translator, and uh, and particularly one of the people I translated had a particular Wilhelm Hennis had a particularly radical and critical take on uh, contemporary understanding of Max Weber, and I learned an awful lot from him. So m- m- temperamentally, I feel myself in the of actually having finished two major projects, which have been very, very long lasting. And having, by doing that, won a space to think about what I want to do next without necessarily rushing into anything. But as I said, that I, I'm very fortunate to be moving in January to work with uh, my friend Eri Nokola, uh, a Finnish political theorist or historian of political thought, 18th century political thought, who's leading a, uh, uh, an ERC project on, a five-year project on the age of liberty in Sweden, which is the pe- mainly the period uh, when uh, Sweden had a, a in effect, a constitutional monarchy, a, a parliamentary democracy, well, not a parliament, the, their Riksdag had uh, passed legislation, had debates and so forth. The only com- comparable form uh, in in Europe um, at that time was, was of course, Britain, um, which mm-hmm. had a parliament which did the same sort of thing. Um, and uh, this is all about how they debated reforms, economic reforms. And my role in this is to um, is to to work out or to 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 read read uh, European, um, let's say Italian, many Italian, French, German, and English works. Um, and to see how they relate to the kinds of arguments they are developing in in Sweden, and so and it's very open ended. Uh, we our first year we'll just be simply trying to work out exactly the direction <laughs> or the way the way the project uh, develops, and there will be a project a, 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 a monograph at the end, and I'll probably write one with Ere um, because I, there's a great crossover with his interests. He he. He's worked, done a lot of work on German 18th century um, political writing, mm. uh, and, and, and an area I've worked on. And mm. so, in a sense, I'm, I, I, I aim to retreat from the modern world back to the early modern <laughs> world, simply because actually it's more satisfying to work on because that you, you, in a sense, those resources are finite. Part of the problem of working on 
modern materials is that you there's so much that you don't know about that, that mm. obviously so much so much data materials that you're never going to have access to uh, and so so there has to be a superficiality in writing about the present day or mm. as i said the, the material you know the material just doesn't exist mm. um so um going back you know, paradoxically going back to the past means that you have a uh, a much firmer grip of the available data and material. Um, mm. And in a sense, for my age, this is something more satisfying to do. But I think it has great, great impact because what we're also doing at the same time is rewriting the way in which or rethinking the way in which we we relate ideas and events and circumstances to, mm. to actually, rather than see the, the, in intellectual history, there's a great deal of emphasis on ideas in context but as i say in my book uh, the context usually turns out to be other ideas and mm -hmm. so what we're trying to do is to um, look and see how institutions are so important reconstruct an, an understanding of those institutions and also circumstances and events um, mm -hmm. and, and this involves you know things like um uh, brain prices or or climate and this sort of thing. The, these this sort of thing getting getting into grips with what the weather was like in this particular period mm -hmm. and therefore what the grain harvest were like or mm -hmm. you know what the relationship between the baltic and the and and britain was uh in in the in the grain trade in particular periods and all these kinds of these these are contextual matters which don't get get passing mention sort of in in intellectual history but but mm. I'd, I, what i'd like what i my ambition is to sort of uh to, to use a a, a well-worn metaphor to reverse the flow on um ideas and context to actually just to, to work from the context to the ideas rather from the ideas to the context mm. Mm. sounds like a very fascinating project and uh look forward to reading your chapter potentially right in that the monograph <laughs> And well, thanks thank very you much very indeed. much, Keith. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Really enjoyed listening to you. And I do encourage our listeners to pick up the book and read it. Fascinating book with lots of great information. Well, thank you again. It's, very, it's a great honor to, to have been able to talk to you.